Awesome. Thank you, Cassie. And it's nice to see everyone here. Thank you for making it. As Cassie mentioned, I'm Olivia Chinchilla. I graduated from Northwestern in 2018. So I majored in economics and political science, and then I minored in Slavic studies. I actually took Polish there. I have a little uh, bit of Polish ancestry. My mom is from Poland. So I actually got to go and study abroad back to Poland in the middle of my time at Northwestern. And that was really formative because that's when I decided that I wanted to teach. And that's also when I got to explore my heritage. So I'd love to talk more about that in uh, later in the session. But right now I actually teach economics for a global affairs institution here in San Francisco. So this is the Bay Bridge right behind me or the San Francisco Golden Gate. Uh, but anyhow, I, I'm really awesome. It's a really awesome program that I teach for. I really love it because um, we get to go over a variety of topics. So it's a three part program, you could say. We teach students from nearly 200 different schools throughout the Bay. So they all come to us. And then we have weekly classes. So recent classes that I've been teaching, I've been teaching on the German far right, so political movements in Europe. I'm teaching on the immigration within the context of COVID right now, this week, as well as we're talking about sanctions and what's happening there. Um, so there's a lot of variety to the subjects that we teach in class. I focus mostly on economics, domestic politics, and technology. So the second part of the program is we actually get to go out into the field and meet with different people in different industries all around the country and the world. So a few of my favorite field studies, I spearheaded a field study in Silicon Valley here on artificial intelligence. So we got to go to all of the companies around the Bay that are working on AI. And then uh, we were also in Europe in November. So we went to a, a field study on energy in the Netherlands. We got to go visit a lot of farms and see their production there. They actually are the second largest food producer in the world. Um, and then we also on that same trip went to a conference in Portugal. So that's kind of the third step of the program where students get to go out and debate on in either a model UN format or a model Congress format on some of the topics that we're covering. So it's a really, uh, really multifaceted program. And I really love that we're focused on global affairs and also get to travel usually. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Thanks, Olivia. And we'll move to Giselle. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I actually graduated from Weinberg in 2012, and I went to medical school at Northwestern as well, and I graduated in 2016. So at Weinberg, I studied neurobiology, and then I did a minor in art history, so a little bit of science and arts, so both sides of the brain. Um, but I went through medical school and ultimately now I am working at Lurie Children's. I'm a pediatric hospitalist, which is kind of a new role in pediatrics where you just work in the hospital setting um, in different areas of the hospital itself. And it also opens up the opportunities to be more involved in education or administration and um, also like quality improvement in the hospital. So I really like that there's a lot of different facets of that career path. Um, and right now I'm doing a lot of education at Northwestern and at the medical school. Awesome, thanks Giselle and Elena. Yeah, hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Elena Dennis, I graduated from Weinberg in 2016. Um, I'd actually started in Medill, but pretty quickly switched out after I decided I didn't wanna be a journalist. Um, and I, that was a good decision on my part. Um, I sort of fell into to majoring in political science because I wanted to write about politics and I ended up adding minors of history and sociology, um, which I think actually would have been great things for me to major in as well because poli-sci ended up being a little too theoretical for me. But um, I am now working at the Chicago Bar Foundation um, where I did a Chicago Field Studies internship my senior year. Um, so I did something else, which we'll talk about uh, shortly, but found my way back to the CBF a couple years ago. And um, we're a legal aid organization, though we don't provide direct services. We do work on a larger systemic level where we're doing legislative advocacy. We're working with the courts and other stakeholders to improve the experience and make it easier for people without lawyers to access the civil legal system. And then we also provide grants to about 30 different legal aid organizations that do provide direct services. Um, so as manager of development and events, I do fundraising a lot on sort of the, the corporate and law firm giving side, and I manage our events. Um, and it's definitely an interesting time for us as we start to pivot those to virtual ones. Great. Thanks everyone for our introductions. And Elena, we'll start with you with our first question. 
Um, what were some of the impactful classes or experiences for you in school that led you to con consider and pursue your chosen field, which I guess you're lucky you had that CFS experience, but definitely tell us more yeah. uh, other experiences on campus. Yeah, so when I was thinking about this, really two classes came to mind um, that were pretty similar. Um, they were both seminars where, you know, there were about a dozen people in the class, and I think that really was part of why they've stuck with me and why I think I've learned so much from them, even though I had some great bigger lecture classes. They're not the ones that I remember as well four years out. Um, so the first of which I would say is uh, I took a freshman seminar. Um, the topic was something like politics of punishment. It was actually taught by a graduate student who was like one of the best teachers I had at Northwestern. Um, I looked him up, he's, he's no longer at Northwestern. He moved on to somewhere else as a professor, but um, it was a really cool class because we really thought about what, what uh, the criminal justice system is about, why we punish people, um, how that shows state power, kind of all these really interesting questions where I kind of already knew what I thought on a topic, but the class taught me to sort of defend what I thought and sort of really think about why I thought those things, which I think just really solidified um, some of the beliefs and my interest in the legal system. And then my senior year, I took a seminar um, with uh, Tracy Birch, um, and it was criminal justice policy. And again, there was a lot of sort of similar topics, um, but really just kind of thinking about how the legal system works and kind of all the sort of unfair aspects of it. And um, that was part of what really got me so interested in, in working in um, increasing access to justice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then with the Chicago Field Studies, can you share a little bit about that experience and how that played in a little bit later than you may have thought? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, it's interesting, like now in my job, I don't work on like anything I actually worked on when I was an intern. Um, you know, I think that speaks a little bit to sort of how intern projects can be so random. You're, you sort of get lucky with whatever the organization is working on on that time. So when I was an intern, I worked a lot more on sort of the program side, but now as someone on the development team, it's a lot more operations. But um, when I was an intern, I just got to sort of learn about all these different organizations we worked with and all the really important work they were doing and the different problems that people have um, when you're accessing the court system without a lawyer. Um, I mean, I will say, because I assume not everyone here has a, a great understanding of the legal system, but on the civil side, you don't automatically get a lawyer. That's only on the criminal side. So um, on the civil side of the system, the statistics are something like 70% of cases have at least one person who's unrepresented. And so um, that's really where we come in to try to create things like referral sheets and hotlines and, and really working with all the players in the system, informing judges. Um, and so a lot of that is just stuff I wouldn't have ever thought about if I hadn't had the opportunity to have that internship with CFS. And then um, the CFS like class topic was about civic engagement. And so I got to sort of hear about how others were working with similar organizations. Um, and it, yeah, just kind of opened me up to this whole different area that I wouldn't have learned about because, you know, I hadn't had any experience with the, with the legal system myself or through any family members or anything like that. Yeah, that's great. That's really helpful. Thanks, Elena. And we'll move to Giselle. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so yeah, thinking about the classes I took at Northwestern and some different experiences. So some of the classes that were a little aligned in medicine that I found really interesting and really helped to shape my career were, there was this one class called the Neurobiology of Memory. And it went from taking these conceptual classes, such as, you know, the intro to biology and organic chemistry and making it more theoretical. And I think kind of thinking that way helps a lot in the medical field. And so kind of going through that class and trying to think in a different way than just the usual studying for those 
intro to kind of organic chemistry and biology type classes was really helpful and really kind of opened my eyes to what it's like to actually be in medicine because when you're in the undergrad setting it's a little hard to imagine what your career is going to be like since you're just kind of going through the motions with those classes and um, that kind of takes me into a little more of the experiences that I think helped to shape my career so while I was in my undergraduate studies, I actually did do some research at Northwestern with the dermatology department and actually being able to go into the clinical setting and doing some research there, I was able to see you know, what it was like to actually be a physician, what the research aspect of medicine is like, um, and how there's different parts of research, not just sitting in a lab, but also doing research with actual patients that can help with their clinical outcomes. So that was kind of interesting um, and helped to kind of shape where my career has gone now, where I'm now doing more clinical type research. And then thinking of something outside of the medical field, but actually I think is very helpful was that I worked at the Evanston Art Center during some work study time while I was at Northwestern. And it was really interesting to be working there, helping with their events, kind of working with different personalities, different people, um, kind of doing some of their teaching of their classes. And I think with that, I've learned a lot of, you know, communication skills and skill sets outside of your usual science, medicine type skills. And I think it's very helpful um, for any sort of career having that sort of experience. So I really enjoyed that. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing. And Olivia. Well, I think one of the really interesting things is when I was in college, I didn't think originally that I was going to teach. As I mentioned, I first got that idea when I was on study abroad. And what really drew me to teaching at that point was I just loved, loved, loved how excited the teachers were about everything. And I went from barely being able to speak a sentence, like getting out of the train station and having to ask someone, do you speak English and barely getting that out in Polish to conversational at the end of 10 weeks. And I was just blown away by how much I progressed. I said, if I can do that in someone else's life, be that person that gives them that motivation to learn and helps them with the information is just that support. That's really an awesome thing. And I've seen that time and again, like this week in class, I was, or last Thursday in one of our classes, I was blown away by how the students were analyzing privacy in the context of today and just really taking it to the next level. And I think if you can be that enabler, that's what I really love about teaching. Um, so I realized that on study abroad that I wanted to teach at some point. And at the time, though, I was in Naval ROTC, so I was planning on going into the military when I graduated and serving in the Navy. I ended up getting medically disqualified because of some athletic injuries. So at that point, I was like, wow, what am I going to do? And I was really freaked out. I went to a career fair, fair and the very first booth that I, or second booth I talked to was someone from a nationwide teaching organization and I was like, oh, this is perfect. Like, I can teach. Like, I have a backup plan. And I ended up um, getting accepted to that program early. I was super stoked about it. And then, lo and behold, when I went to graduate, I was like, oh, wait, I should probably get, get surgery to fix my athletic injury. So I ended up um, deferring that program for a year, which was a little bit challenging. Um, but then I said, well, you know, I want to find something in the meantime. And I found the program that I'm in right now. And I've just loved it so much that I ended up staying here. And I plan to stay here for the foreseeable future. And so I think having that flexibility was one of the things that I learned um, in ROTC and Northwestern as a whole. And um, some of the, my favorite classes that I took when I was there, um, I took uh, for what I, relevant to what I teach, I took... Um, the, my favorite political science classes, I think, were two. The one that convinced me to be a major was Mary Dietz's uh, Modernity and Discontents. I still actually keep in touch with her, so that's really wonderful to, to like have a teacher that, again, inspired me um, to study and, and still is there as a mentor now. I also uh, took Wendy Perlman's Politics in the Middle East, and that class, I think, really just set me on fire for learning about the world and all of these different issues, because in the first 15 minutes of the class, I was a astounded and blown away by how Wendy just reframed Middle Eastern politics. So I was, I was really um, happy to take that class. And I think those two classes in terms of political science were the biggest ones. And economics, I love behavioral economics, but I must say that I think the conceptual framework within economics and just working through the material and understanding all of the differences 
is what makes me able to get that information and teach the students right now, uh, less so than like any one particular class that catapulted me into economics, because it is a subject, as a lot of subjects are, that you really just have to work at repetitively to, to understand. Um, so, so yeah, so those were the, I think, some of my favorite classes that helped me on my career trajectory. Yeah, definitely. And Olivia, you mentioned a little bit about my next question already about uh, your first job, which is great, um, and whether it was exactly what you were looking for. So I'm curious if like this was maybe your plan A, B, or C, and how you um, approach strategizing your career from that point. Well, I believe I've already hinted it was probably plan C, but I must say though that that's the beauty of being flexible is I would have never found this job if I had been in the military. I would have never found this job if I had been in that first teaching job. And I found this job that in some ways is like the perfect job that I could ever imagine. Like I, I get to, to study all of these issues that I'm so passionate about and make a lot of uh, direction in terms of where I want to go to. So that's the, the beauty of the classes as well is that oftentimes it's whatever uh, subject is most relevant to students or most interesting uh, to pursue because we have a lot of flexibility in terms of what we teach. So I get to really pursue a lot of areas that I'm super fascinated about. So I love uh, that aspect. I also love the aspect that we get to literally go out into the world and see things up front. Like we were on the U.S.-Mexico border for an immigration field study and we actually crossed over the bridge into Matamoros, Mexico and got to speak with immigrants firsthand and hear their stories of why they were coming to the U.S. And so this was actually just last summer, um, right when they were announcing the new Remain in Mexico policy. So to be there on a spot, in a spot that's a critical aspect of immigration while events are unfolding, it just blows my mind sometimes how it's awesome to have that front row seat. Therefore, I think the, the takeaway is I really love the fact that I'm in this in a position that I wouldn't have thought of before or considered. And so I found that I think through uh, a ver various changes within what I had thought originally, but nonetheless, just taking those chances and, and stepping out is, is I think what really, really brought me here. In terms of my overall career trajectory, I see this as, as, a, as a step into, into the future. Right now, I'm happy to be here right now, but I think, um, I think down the road, I'd like to continue in policy or politics in some areas. I'm very passionate about um, criminal justice. I also really am excited about uh, military psychology. So those are the two areas that I find most fascinating and perhaps might pursue those more in depth in the future. But um, for, the, for the current situation, this is really awesome to be here. Yeah, that's great, Olivia. I love that story of being flexible with that first job and finding something you really enjoy, which is great. Um, and we'll move to Giselle next. Yeah, so medicine is a little different than some other careers in how your job works. So I just started my first official job in July. <laughs> Um, but you go through this whole process where you match into a residency after medical school and, you know, going through medical school, you have to figure out which residency you want to do. And so going into that, I thought I wanted to do pediatrics and I decided to have an open mind, kind of see all the different specialties and decide while I was in med school, and I ultimately decided to do pediatrics. Um, but I think your experiences while you're in medical school really shape what you decide to do. And if you go in with an open mind, that's the best kind of advice I could give, um, because you really don't know. I know a lot of people who change their mind throughout the process. Um, with the whole residency process, it's a match, so you kind of rank places and they rank you. And um, I did not match in my number one place, but I did match in an amazing program in Miami, where I'm from, and it actually ended up being such an amazing opportunity because I was able to work on my medical Spanish skills. I was able to see really interesting patients. Um, and I think it really shapes the type of clinician that I am now. So just to say that, you know, you might not end up at the place you 100% had your hopes on, but it all works out. And it sometimes might even be better than you even imagined. Um, even going through that, I did know a lot of people that had their hearts set on certain types of specialties. And I think if you work hard through medical school, finding research, finding good mentors, um, you really, if you set your heart to it, can make it happen, even if it is one of those competitive types of specialties. 
And ultimately choosing my career, I decided to choose um, hospitalist medicine because it gives you a lot of opportunities, like I said, to work in different aspects of medicine. So um, you can be more involved in what's called quality improvement of the hospital. So actually working with the hospital system to make the healthcare system a little, um, in, I guess, more uh, appropriate for patient care and just make sure you have better outcomes. Um, other things you can do is you can be very involved with education and you can be involved in the administration of the hospital system itself. Um, you also have a lot of free time, so it's shift work. So when I'm at work, I'm working hard, but when I leave, I kind of have the time for myself so I can focus on things that I like outside of medicine, so art, art history. And so I really liked that career. So I think coming out of residency, this job has been great for me. Um, in terms of where my path is going, I think I definitely want to add more medical education opportunities and a little bit more of that quality improvement that I was talking about. But you really, your career can go in many different directions in medicine. And I think that's what makes it really fun. Yeah, absolutely. That's great, Giselle. I like your approach on um, the hospitalist and giving you opportunities down the road. I'm curious with the pediatrics you mentioned, like you were solidified in what you thought you'd enjoy. What, what were some of the moments where you were like, okay, I, I do want to go down this road? Yeah, I think pediatrics as a population, you know, dealing with kids is something that's really fun in that it's a different set of people who want to be around children all the time, you know. It's a little bit more of a happy setting. You can be a little more playful. Um, at times, of course, it can be a little more sad than in other situations because of that. Um, but I think I thought to myself, if I never saw a child in a clinic setting again, would I be upset versus if I never saw an adult? And when I sat down and thought about that, um, I realized that I really needed that little bit of joy of having a child, you know, laughing when you tell a stupid joke or talking to them about Moana. And so I realized that I really wanted to kind of experience that. And then the kind of illnesses and um, the healthcare system in pediatrics is a little bit different than in adult medicine as well. So I would just enjoy those kind of um, illnesses and that kind of medical thinking. Yeah, that's great. I like that, how you evaluated the two. Thank you. <laughs> of course. We'll move to Elena. Yeah, so um, the headline on my first job is that I ended up quitting it. So um, just previewing that and then I'll backtrack. Um, so uh, right when I was finishing up my, my winter quarter senior year, which was my last quarter, I got into Teach for America. Um, and, uh, you know, I at that point hadn't applied to that many other jobs because, you know, as I'm sure a lot of you will experience, the timing of the sort of things you were looking for wouldn't, you wouldn't apply until there was like an opening. It wasn't like I was applying to consulting jobs like all of my friends where they were applying in the fall. I sort of had to wait other than for TFA. And so when I got into Teach for America, um, I, I think I knew that that opportunity was there and I didn't know what else was out there. I thought it was a great way that I could make an impact on something that I really cared about. I would say education, educational inequity is sort of the other second major area of interest for me. Um, and so I, I felt like I could make a really direct impact. Um, it was a really prestigious program. So I was thinking about it like looking good long-term career-wise, which um, in hindsight, I would really advise against. I think there were, there were ways that I made that decision that were not really the best. I should have thought more about like my actual skills and what I wanted my work environment to look like. And um, I did not want the chaotic work environment that is a classroom. So I moved up to Milwaukee. I was teaching seventh grade math um, in a charter school on the Northwest side and made it through all sort of the intensive summer training. Um, and really a few weeks in the school year, I was just feeling physically awful all of the time. I didn't feel like I was doing a very good job of teaching. One of the only things that I was good at was staying calm while like children were running around the classroom um, because that is something I'm good at and that's, that's something that works out really well in an event scenario. But um, other than that, nothing was going well in my classroom. Even though I understood that 
I was new to it and there were things that I could do where it would get better. Ultimately, I just kind of thought about what I needed in terms of organization and just identifying that that was never really going to happen. Um, also, the end of the school year would be just like such a far away goal. I'm someone who I think likes to have more defined projects and really check things off and kind of get to the other side of them, um, which works really well with events. So it was a really tough decision to quit. Um, obviously, I felt like I was letting everybody down um, and I felt like it was going to be really awful to quit my first job. And while all of that was very valid and I did feel really terrible, it was 100% the right decision. Um, it was very hard to find a job after that. Um, you know, I wasn't having a whole lot of luck generally in terms of submitting applications or making it past a phone screen, but I got lucky, I sort of fell into something. I was working at a educational startup, um, which was an entirely remote job, which has taught me, taught me some really good skills for, for doing all of my job remotely now. Um, but it was a contract position. So I had the flexibility that once my lease was up in Milwaukee, I could explore leaving Milwaukee and I wanted to come back to Chicago. I was born here and just really liked the city. And then basically, again, got lucky with um, there being a job open where I had had my CFS, CFS internship and where they really liked me as an intern. Um, and so it was a very easy interview process. I, inter I drove down, I interviewed in the morning. They called me later that afternoon to offer me the job. So that's not very likely to happen to you, but um, just sort of sharing that there's so much random chance, I think, in the career search process. So, um, you know, you just really have to have as many connections as possible to see where there's those openings might happen. And I mean, I work at a 13 person organization at the time we were 12, actually. And, you know, the chances that a job opened up when I needed one were so limited and let alone like one that actually fit what I was looking for. So, um, you know, unfortunately, there's just a lot kind of outside of your control. But, um, you know, that's why you sort of have to have a bunch of irons in the fire so that something does work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great. Thanks for sharing, Elena. I, we really appreciate hearing this story because I'm sure you're not alone with the first job not being the right fit. Um, and so we appreciate you sharing. And we'll come to you with this next question. Um, and I'm excited to hear your all your responses because I know you guys are all coming from very different fields, industries, jobs. Um, but what has surprised you about what you learned in school that you use today? And, and how do you see your arts and science background playing out in your work? Yeah, so I honestly, I, when I was thinking about this question in terms of preparing for this panel, um, there wasn't a whole lot that came to mind. And I think that's something where there's just like all this really intangible stuff that you learn with a liberal arts degree that you can't necessarily directly apply. Like I can't say that, you know, I learned specific facts in like one class that like apply to my current role, but I learned a lot about how to think about the world and in, in a critical way. Um, and, and that's kind of the stuff that I think has helped me now. I think also one of the things is like my organization, I would say is pretty conservative in our approach. We've had the same executive director for 20 years, um, which has a lot of benefits, but um, there are also some places where, um, you know, he's of an older generation that he's not quite as aware um, of things he says that are potentially offensive to other groups. Um, and there's stuff that I really learned in college about kind of how to approach those conversations, which I think has been really useful. And, and one of my other coworkers who's around the same age and she, um, you know, she had a graduate degree in gender studies, like the two of us kind of often talk about this, the ways that we talked about these things in school and how we can have those conversations at work with someone who comes from like a very different framework. And we're not always successful, obviously, because he's the boss and ultimately what he says wins, but um, it's helpful to sort of allowing us to have those open conversations where we think about whether we're being, you know, culturally responsive in the way that we act towards our different um, stakeholders. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. And uh, Giselle. Sure. So I think um, in terms of things from college that I use to this day, it's very similar in terms of 
the way of thinking, conceptualizing. So actually with my art history classes, I kind of took that into medical school. There was an art in medicine class that I had taken. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it was about the way of thinking. And so in art history, it's not so much that you're um, just learning about the paintings, but you're learning about the process of painting. And so what the brushstrokes mean for the painting, how that creates the feeling the artist wants to create. And so you can kind of liken that to medicine where you think of, okay, you know, this is your physical exam, this is the labs, um, these are the images, and so how, do, how does all of this come together to be what the patient has and how you should treat the patient? So I think it's interesting that you can take some of those classes and make that into your thought process as a physician. Um, but other things I think that were helpful were also having those group settings, having um, that time to actually talk things through with your fellow students and being able to do a little bit of public speaking was actually very helpful for medicine because you don't realize that you actually have to be doing a lot of public speaking in that you do presentations on each of your patients. You are expected to present some form of research throughout your residency or um, in your job. So it actually was very helpful to have those kinds of settings where you had to either present a project or talk with a group in the class. So I think all of those things were really helpful. Yeah, definitely. That's great, Giselle. More great examples. And we'll finish this question with Olivia. Before I answer the question, I actually want to second what Elena had said earlier about chance. The How I actually found this job was through my best friend in college. She recommended me and it was totally just being in the right place at the right time. I went from being on a vacation to two days later in a classroom teaching. So it, it really you just need to take those chances and also be open to chance. And that might sound scary, but it's actually really, I think, wonderful too to think that sometimes awesome opportunities can come up that you will never have imagined before. Uh, but in terms of what Northwestern did to prepare me, I think overall, the overarching theme is that it really helped me be able to organize. And I don't just mean my own life or my lesson plans, but also be able to organize groups of people and be willing to like bring in all of those ideas into the room and just be open to hearing and curating all of those different ideas as well. I think in terms of several, a few uh, key things that really helped um, in a practical sense within what I did in Northwestern, I think the extracurriculars were really awesome. Um, I did Fed Challenge, the Federal Reserve Challenge for all four years. It's an economics competition. So I actually got to speak. So you actually go to the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, speak for 15 minutes, and then it's a 15 minute Q&A. And so that uh, I organized the team my last year. So that was a great organizational um, experience. But I also was just learning economics. And now I'm able to share about the Federal Reserve with my students and just bring in that passion about monetary international uh, economics policy. I also uh, TA'd for um, intro to macro with David Berger. So that was interesting because a lot of most of the time undergrads don't actually serve as a TA, but I did in my last year. And it was a big challenge actually a lot of time, but I really enjoyed it and it later came <laughs> to, to be a good experience to actually have that in the classroom teaching experience while I was in college. So similar to what Elena was saying earlier with keep your coals in the fire, I don't think you'll ever do something at Northwestern that is not a benefit to you in some way later on. And probably right now, you're not knowing exactly how it's going to benefit you, but just do what you're interested in because those skills will come back some way or the other. I'd say another thing that really surprises me is how much I actually um, rely on all of the uh, mental focus training I did in Ultimate Frisbee. So I played throughout my four years of college and playing a sport takes a lot of mental focus and I think teaching does as well. So just the other night I was on a, a phone call with my colleague and I was like, oh yeah, remember this book that I keep referencing, Mind Gym, <laughs> that our coach had us read. So it's really, uh, really interesting to see how sometimes those really small things come back. A couple other um, really small skills that were helpful was writing. I actually um, just, the Weinberg degree makes you write. And I ended up, I, I use it every day, or not every day, but quite frequently in my job right now. I actually wrote a 40 page brief on the opioid crisis for the students for one of their debates. Um, and I also just speaking with people. I, every day as a teacher, you have to speak with people. And I think that can be used in every job. And just having that love and interest in people is something that really, really was a through 
through thread of my Northwestern experience. Yeah, absolutely, Olivia, that's great. Shouting out to some of those different skills. And I feel like you each shared, you know, some great examples of how uh, arts and science background plays out in different ways in every field. Um, and uh, I'm gonna ask this next question kind of as a combo question and just shout out to students at this point. Please feel free to chat in questions to the group or chat me privately, because um, we're gonna get to your questions here shortly. Um, but before doing that, I'm curious if you guys can share a little bit more about how your work in your industry has shifted due to the current um, global pandemic. And in knowing how your industry has shifted, can you make recommendations for students on how to network in your line of work? And we'll start with you, Olivia. Yeah, so we actually have moved all of our classes online, which is a different setting. They went very smoothly, very well. We, the awesome part, I think, is we got to bring in speakers from all over the country in their various industries. So, for example, we had um, the director of counterterrorism at the FBI in Chicago come speak to us about counterterrorism and mass shootings. Um, we've had experts on Middle Eastern politics, the coronavirus, et cetera. So it's really awesome to have a different component. So I'd say one thing um, that's really cool is just to think, be creative in this space right now because we feel so limited, but the truth is there's a lot you can do, a lot you can leverage. I think as we move into the summer, and I think for any teachers that perhaps in the fall might have to start teaching, it's a, it's a little bit more challenging because you have a whole new group of students and people that you haven't met. So maybe that's the way some of you feel in your classes right now, or it's like, wait, I'm starting new classes with people I've never met before. It feels so strange. But I think in those cases, just reaching out to the people still and getting to know them as much as possible and perhaps in addition to all of your classes could be helpful. The other thing I would say in terms of networking specifically is be patient because Right now, there's some people that are available, for example, to speak or might be available to network that never would have been or never would have been able to come. But on the other hand, there's also people that are super, super busy and stressed for whatever reason. Maybe there's some aspect that's more challenging them for them than for others. So I'd say if someone does, if someone turns you down or seems abrupt, just be okay. My dad had this, this phrase, he's like, some will, some won't, so what? I've been reminding myself of that uh, right now because we had a, a couple speakers that I invited that turned down the invitation. It's like, okay, I understand. It's a, it's a challenging time. So just remember that everyone's challenged by the circumstance. And so try to put yourself in their shoes and just keep trying to meet different people. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Olivia. And we'll move to Giselle. Sure, definitely. So being in the healthcare setting right now is very interesting, um, especially in pediatrics. I think a little bit in the pediatric field, we have a little bit of survivor's guilt in that we aren't as affected as the adult population is. So our hospital has actually been seeing lower volumes than it has in the past. Um, we're operating right now at about 40% capacity and about a couple months ago, we were actually over capacity because of the flu and RSV season, which are just common viruses um, in children. So it's kind of interesting to see that this social distancing has actually decreased the amount of illness in our pediatric population. Um, the other thing that's kind of brought to light is how hospitals run and actually how hospitals make money in order to run. And so since we've had to cancel a lot of our elective surgeries and having to close down some of our non-essential clinics, um, I think we are suffering a little bit as well as, you know, many other fields economically. So because of that, it has kind of changed the mentality in our hospital system. Um, but I think in terms of coronavirus itself, we're all learning each day. We have had a couple patients with it. So I think, you know, things change in terms of what we need to wear at work or what the policies are on visitors. And so I think it's just a stressful time for everyone all around. Um, in terms of, you know, networking or if you want to go into the medical field or even, you know, healthcare administration, I think right now because of all of these issues, um, like Olivia was mentioning, you might have a little bit of pushback or um, might find it a little difficult because people are busy and kind of navigating this. But I think definitely advocating for yourself, you know, pushing for a virtual platform for meeting. Um, 
um, is really helpful um, because we are still doing Zoom meetings. We are still doing educational setting, uh, sessions with the medical school through Zoom. So I think, you know, if you are interested in doing research with someone, you can always reach out and say, hey, can I meet with you via Zoom and just kind of get to know a little bit about what you do, what your career is like. And I think in that way, you can still do a little bit of career exploration without necessarily having to go in to see someone. Yeah, absolutely. That's great advice. The virtual meetings are a great space. Thanks, Giselle. Yeah. Cool. Elena. Yeah, so I'll speak a little bit to um, sort of both the nonprofit and um, the legal industry, since I really sort of straddle both. Um, most people I work with are, are lawyers, both, um, you know, half of our staff is, and then basically everyone externally. Um, it's been interesting for the legal profession because uh, it's definitely uh, a profession that has generally been slow to embrace change. Um, it was only about a year ago that um, the circuit court of Cook County moved entirely, well, I guess really I think it was a statewide thing, they moved entirely to electronic filing. So back when I did my internship at the CBF and I was over um, at this uh, help desk that we run at the basement of the Daily Center, um, we were dealing with a bunch of carbon paper and, you know, stuff that I hadn't experienced in any setting since I was like a kid, but was like how everything worked at the court system. They moved over to electronic filing, um, which was really hard and, and can be especially hard for um, people from, coming from different communities. Um, but, uh, you know, all of that already was an adjustment. So I think that just kind of demonstrates how going to a remote setting has been especially tough. Um, there are specific divisions of the courts that I understand have sort of been able to move more quickly to providing remote services. So um, like domestic violence is an area where they very immediately had to figure out how they could help people with emergency like orders of protection versus um, other parts where they just kind of put everything on pause for a while hoping it was get, gonna get better. And now they're starting to figure out what remote access to the courts looks like. Um, it's actually a really exciting time, I think, for people who are involved in, in legal innovation like our organization is because we've already been thinking about how remote access to the courts would increase the ability for people to um, have a fair chance. I mean, it would be easier for people to not have to come downtown or take time off of work and you know all the different reasons that it could be different, difficult for someone to go to court can often be made easier if they could access it from home and now they're sort of forcing everyone to access it from home. So I think it's, a, it's an exciting time, um, but lawyers generally not used to working from home. Um, so that's been a shift from everybody and we've seen a lot of people just say like we can't do anything because we're working from home so we have a big spring fundraising campaign um that we've had to pivot to an entirely virtual effort um when it's something that usually involves a lot of in-person events at law firms so that's been what i've been dealing with and then I, I think i referenced earlier just moving to virtual events i think that's something that everyone in the nonprofit industry is figuring out right now um and it really depends what sort of events you're thinking about pivoting, some will lend themselves more easily, but it's going to require um, a lot of creativity. So I think, you know, Olivia was talking about that creative aspect earlier, and that's something where um, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm the most creative person. Part of what goes well for events is just like, you know, executing on a bunch of logistics, but um, it's really sort of pushing me to, to be really creative. Um, and then to just briefly speak on the networking aspect, um, I think it's a great opportunity just to really ask anyone that you can because um, while there certainly are people where this is a harder time because of either their work or childcare obligations or, or whatever, um, there are a lot of people whose schedules are way more open. So I would say there are some lawyers who are very used to like traveling all the time that are so much easier to get a hold of right now because a lot of their work has changed, especially if travel was a big component and it was really hard to like nail them down before. So um, I, think, I think there's hope there, but you just really have to be um, you know, proactive and you know, don't take it personally if they, if they can't help you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Elena, that's a great point that some people have more time on their hands if they're not traveling for work and you never know unless you reach out, which is great. Um, and Olivia, did you have something to add on to this? 
Yeah, so just wanted to add, don't ever be afraid to reach out on LinkedIn or on the alumna database. I reached out on LinkedIn for a few of the fields today I was putting together, as I mentioned, on AI. And I reached out to someone that worked in NASA and it was like a response came and it worked out perfectly. And it was just taking that leap of faith to reach out to someone to ask for assistance. And same thing with um, when I was putting together a conference for uh, that we needed access to a specific space. We were trying to get into Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco. And I literally just was like, oh, wait, we're short on people. We need someone to be there to like be with students. And I reached out to like five or six Northwestern alumni that worked at Salesforce and two people came and actually like spent an entire day just watching the debate and being there. And so like just feel that support from the Northwestern community and to see the networking sometimes really pays off is I think incredible and don't ever underestimate how much Northwestern alumni really want to give back and help out in any way possible. Absolutely, definitely. Thanks, Olivia. Um, and this next question is for Giselle, and I think we can have Giselle answer this question and then um, part of it can be answered by Elena and Olivia too. Um, but do you have any tips for someone on the pre-med track, tra starting to pursue pre-med? She also asked like, what's your favorite and most rewarding part of your job and the hardest, most stressful part of your job? And is it a demanding health profession? So three prompt question, um, but let's dive into it and then we can get to Olivia and Elena too. Sure. So I think my biggest advice for anyone doing pre-med is that you have to take those baseline classes, so your biology, your chemistry, your physics. I think find something that you're interested in or passionate about outside of that, and that actually will help you in terms of being happy in your own kind of exploration, but also having things to discuss when you actually apply for medical school or go through residency, because people want their physicians to be regular people, and so we don't want you to just be focused on science all the time. We want you to actually have things you're passionate about, and if you can show you're passionate about something, that's really important. Um, so I would say join as many clubs as you can, you know, look into different classes that aren't necessarily in those sciences, and I think that's the best way to go. Um, in terms of, so that was the first part. The second part was in my field, if it's a very rigorous field. Yes, the yeah. health profession, yeah. So in terms of being a hospitalist, the reason I like this job is that you are kind of having a rigorous workflow while you're in the hospital. So um, most places there you go, you look up your patients, you see kind of what happened overnight, you go and see them, you talk to the families and you come up with your plan and then you see patients as they come into the hospital as well. Um, so while you're there, it can be very busy. Um, but then once you're at home, I don't have patients calling me at home. I pretty much have the time to myself. So I would say in a month, I probably work around 14 to 15 shifts. So I have half of the month actually off. Um, so it's not a very rigorous kind of field. And that's why I like it. I think I like thinking while I'm at work, but I also like having my own time to kind of explore those other things I'm passionate about. Um, in terms of pediatrics, there's many different kind of areas you can can go into and so with each of those you have different workflows um, but you can definitely shape it to be the way you want it to be especially as your career moves forward um, so I think even if you decide you want to do surgery or you want to do something else in the medical field you can definitely shape it to be how you want it um, and then the other thing was what's the best part of my job so I think the best moments are always you know, when you go in and you see your patient and they're doing better and they're smiling and they're telling you a funny joke and you're like, okay, you're ready to go home. I think those moments are always the best and you just feel like, you know, I actually did something to make this patient feel so much better and, you know, make their family feel better about them and get them to where they need to be to go home. So I think those days are always the best. 
In terms of the hardest moment, it's, I would say, always having those difficult conversations. So um, whether that's, you know, a terminal illness and kind of navigating that with the family. Um, so, you know, trying to figure out what's the best way, whether they want treatment, whether they want just um, what's called palliative care. So whether they just want you know, their child to be comfortable for the rest of the time they have, um, and just kind of navigating that, um, or sometimes having difficult patients or families, that's always hard. So I think there's definitely a lot of communication skills that you learn in undergrad, um, and there's a lot of classes that can actually help with navigating those sorts of conversations that I think I've carried through, um, but that's probably the hardest part. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. That's really helpful things to consider with the different areas you go into in medicine and, and beyond. And we have just a few more minutes left. So I'd love to do a quick go around. Um, maybe we'll start with Elena on um, any last advice, insights that you want to leave with students um, today. Um. I feel like I've given away a lot of my main advice tips, but I think, um, you know, I, I think you just sort of have to um, let go of um, as much as you can. I know it's going to be a really stressful time when you go through, um, through your job search, but um, you, you can only put so much in and you really should obviously be putting as much in as you can in terms of having those networking conversations or submitting applications to jobs, even if they're not exactly the right thing you want, um, you know, kind of spread, spread everything widely, but like at the same time, there's just going to be a lot that's out of your control. And so you sort of have to, to like let the process um, run its course um, and just, you know, feel comfortable that you're, you're doing all that you can and that will eventually amount to something. And then, um, you know, if that is not the perfect thing, you can, you know, always leave your job um, at some appropriate time. Um, not, you know, not everyone should quit their first job, but, um, you know, you'll, you'll be able to find something else. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm four years out and I don't expect to do the exact same sort of role um, for the rest of my career. You know, I um, am definitely already thinking about potential different jobs that I would want or graduate degrees, like you don't have to have it figured out in five years um, and you don't have to have it figured out in 30 years. Um, you know, my mom made a career switch at like 55. So it's, it's possible to, to really go a lot of different directions. That's great. Thanks, Elena. And Olivia. The funny part is I was a tour guide in Northwestern and then this piece of advice for students I don't think has changed since like middle of Northwestern, but I'd say my two pieces of advice while you're a student, depending on where you are, but probably throughout the entire time, really don't try to fit four years into one. And by that I mean just don't try to do too much at once because you're doing a lot and whatever you're doing is going to come back to benefit you down the road. You might not see it now, but you will see it even you know, in my position a couple years out. The other piece of advice I'd say is always do things with a purpose. So by that, I mean, don't stress about the purpose, but like don't take a class just because it's easy and don't take it just because it's hard. I've done both of those things and they both turned out different than I expected, but really just throw your heart into what you're really interested in and it will come back. Like I every day use all of the information I learned in my poli sci and econ classes without even ever imagining that literally the subject I'm studying would come back um, to, for me to rely on down the road. And then I'd say transitioning to the career, one thing that has been really helpful, and I've been thinking about this the last couple of weeks as well, is really, really just be open to critique. And by that, I mean like learn how to just take feedback. So for me, um, this is something that I learned in ROTC when it was super uncomfortable at times to like be, be a leader and like have that direct feedback in military style. And at one point in midway through college, I was like, wait, I have to be open to just, just hearing the truth. And this has come back in this first position as well, where I genuinely, in order to get better as a teacher, need to hear that feedback and take it without any sort of offense. And then I'd say the other two really big things that for me have been important um, with this transition in this job is, is one, know what you don't know. So this was, um, I'd say particularly true in negotiation for like, wages, uh, which is something I really didn't know much about. But I'd say I, I made a mistake to not necessarily um, ask someone that knew more than me. So I'd say when you don't know something and you know you don't know it, go and ask your mentors. And so that leads me to, I think, 
one of my biggest takeaways, which is really just rely on the power of mentors and cultivate those relationships with people. So whether that's in your job, I've had an awesome, awesome uh, opportunity to, to be mentored by someone that's been in education for over a decade and also outside of your position or wherever you are. So I rely, I talked to Northwestern people that I knew, I talked to uh, my former Frisbee coach, I talked to so many people that really just, just having those different touch points on different subjects that can go alongside you and mentor you is really, really powerful and huge. And I think has helped me grow tremendously. Great, thanks Olivia. And we'll close out with Giselle. Yeah, so I think kind of looking at what everyone said, even though we're all in very different fields, I think a lot of the concepts are similar um, and a lot of the advice is very similar. So I think stay open minded. If you find something along the way that interests you, follow that. Um, because from my mentors and just seeing how my career has gone, you really don't know how it's going to be five years along the way and what's going to spark your interest. So definitely be open-minded and chase those interests that you find along the way. Um, and then like Olivia was saying, you know, seek out those mentors, ask them how they got to their point. Um, if you're interested in being the medical director, go ahead and ask them, you know, what were the things you did and why are you passionate about this career choice? So I think just, you know, picking people's brains, being open-minded and just finding things you're passionate along the way about is, I think, the way to go.